the day before I'm supposed to leave, I get a phone call. And it's the person that was bringing the drugs from Colombia to Quito, Ecuador. And he says, I should be there in about two hours. I'll meet you in the lobby. And so I said, all right, no problem. So two hours pass by. I go downstairs to the lobby and I'm sitting there waiting. And this gentleman walks in. You know, he says, hey, I'm Diego. How's it going? Everything. I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? You know, we act like we're old buddies, like everything's all right. He hands me a bag where I think, you know, the shoes and stuff are coming in. And next thing you know, I go to get up and just everybody is all over me. They throw me to the ground, you know. They handcuff me, they pick me up, they put me in the elevator, they take me upstairs to my room. When we walk in, there's already police inside my room going through everything. They got the safe open, they're, they're you know, looking at my jewelry, they're looking at my, you know, my passport. They're like, oh, this passport's fake. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to warn you, this is going to be one of those stories that will keep you at the edge of your seat. Today, I have Oscar Castro here to share how a failed drug smuggling operation in Ecuador landed him in an Ecuadorian maximum security prison for seven years. We get all the behind the scenes details of life in prison in a foreign country and how different it truly is from the American justice system. Oscar's story deserves to be a movie, and I'm honored and excited to share it with you today. Now sit back, relax, and get ready to lock into this roller coaster of an episode with Oscar Castro. Oscar, welcome to Locked In, man. Thank you, man. Ian, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy, you know, you giving me the, the chance to uh, tell my story. Dude, I love your energy. You know, it's always good. You know, it's going to be a good episode when a guest comes in all hyped up. Thank you for the gift. Uh, I'll have it on my uh, YouTube community wall. Literally the coolest thing no problem, anyone's man. ever gotten for me. Describe what it is so people know. So basically, you know, uh, it's a Funko Pop. You know, you pop yourself, go online. You can make um, a character. You can make anybody you want. So I thought about it. Um, you know, what could I bring you? You know, something to show just, you know, you know, how I feel, you know, just the appreciation. So basically, you know, went online, found it, you know, tried to make a, an exact <laughs> mark like you are. And um, it, it came out pretty good, I think. What yeah, do you think? It's spot on, man. Right? Um, when I was at dinner with Chevy last night, he had like this little painting and it's like me with the glasses. Now anyone, anytime anyone sees a kid with glasses or whatever, they send it to me like, look at your twin. Wow. But that thing is literally spot on. Coolest fucking thing ever. Perfect, man. Yeah. I'm so happy you liked it. Thank you, man. No but problem. I appreciate you coming out here today. I'm glad we got to your episode before our good friend Johnny Mitchell. That's right, <laughs> Johnny, we love him you. Tease him. Yeah, we love Johnny and um, excited to dive into your episode today. You're our first person on the show that's been to a foreign prison and that's incredible. Um, everyone's always asking about like out of the country prisons, uh, a lot of like, you know, like Russia, Europe, everything like that. And so you, you bring a, a, an interesting perspective on it today. Um, but before we get to that part, let's start with your story. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? All right. So basically, I uh, grew up in a small town in Jersey. Um, you know, just got with the wrong crowd around the teenage, you know, era. Um, wasn't doing good in school. Really didn't like to go to school. Didn't do homework. None of that stuff. Um, got into smoking weed with the wrong crowd early. And um, I guess that was like my gateway entrance was marijuana into the game. Um, I was in uh, seventh grade, you know, selling weed. You know, people would come from the high schools to come, you know, grab, you know, five for 20 from me. It was insane. You know, the teacher would be like, why are these people waiting outside for you? And I'd be like, oh, no, we're going to, you know, going to go play football at the field, you know. But it was crazy, man. Um, good childhood. You know, my parents were great, amazing, you know. It's not always the parents' fault when the kid goes off track. You know, that's that's number one. You know, my family was great. They always gave me everything I wanted. Um, Hardworking, you know, immigrant family. And um, I had a great examples, you know, my mother hardworking, also my father. And that, again, examples that I just didn't, you know, follow through with. At the end of the day, I liked making money easily. So, you know, I was always hustling something. From a young age, I would hustle anything from, you know, basketball cards, you know, baseball cards, football cards, autograph plaques like Jordan, Patrick Ewing, you know. I would buy them at one price, sell them for another to friends at school. And um, I guess that just grew with me. And then I just took it and 
used it somewhere else. But um, I dropped out of school at 17, and um, my father told me, you know, if you want to drop out, you're going to have to get a job immediately. So basically um, got a job, and my first job ever was working at a Barnes & Noble's warehouse. Now, this is where the story basically begins because this is where I meet my contact into basically a Colombian drug family, okay? Um, I'm working at this warehouse. I meet this kid. We'll call him G. And um, we he invites me to a party, show up at the party, and there's a bunch of people, you know, well-dressed. You know, you could tell they're, you know, upper-level drug traffickers there, you know, big cars, a lot of gold, you know, a lot of beautiful women, and um, end up speaking with a gentleman that actually tells me, you know, you'd be great to um, bring up drugs from South America. So I tell him, all right, you know, what is it? What do we do? He said, basically, you'll just catch a flight, you know, you'll go on vacation. We'll give you money. You know, you, you could have whatever you want, women, you want, you know, on drugs, cocaine, marijuana, whatever you want down there. You'll stay maybe a month or so, and then you come back. Now, in those days, I'm talking pre-9-11. So, you know, airports were a lot different. There wasn't the scanner machines. There was none of that. So basically, um, I went down, you know, had my vacation, you know, had a good time, went out to all the clubs and um, had, a, had fun. And then when it was time to come back, you know, they'll give you a pair of shoes. Each shoe has 400 grams in it, you know, and then maybe they might give you another pair of shoes that you could throw in your bag. So this is what I brought back my first time coming from uh, Columbia straight to JFK. Um, landed, you know, the people that I was connected with here basically picked me up at the airport. You know, we go back to an apartment, um, take all the drugs out. They take everything out of the shoes. They unpack everything. You know, they weigh it, and uh, they pay me $20 a gram. So um, first score was a kilo, right? So basically $20 a gram, you're making 20 grand. Um, after that, you know, I get more involved with them, um, basically, you know, helping them go charge money, spots where, you know, people that owe them. Basically, they would give, you know, a couple bricks of heroin, maybe to, say, one of the project dealers, we would have to go pick up this money and bring it back to them. Um, just little by little getting more involved and deeper into the drug game with them. So this is about 98. Um, 1999, I decided to go on another trip. Once again, uh, flying to Medellin this time, Colombia. And I was there for about 15 days, not too long. Same thing, you know, partying, going out every night. And um, when it's time to come back, you know, just grab your pair of shoes and hop on the plane. There was no problems. You know, I thought it was the easiest way to make money ever. I couldn't believe it was happening. And I was so young, you know. And um, just thinking about the money you were going to get when you come back. And then, you know, young and stupid, not thinking about maybe putting money away, saving it. You're coming back. You're splurging on everything. You know, you're going out best, best food. You know, let's get a Mercedes. Let's get a gold chain. You know, you know, the drug dealer kit, you know, you know the way it is. And um, little by little, you know, the money goes away. You know, if you don't have a plan, you know, and the drug came, it's the money. As soon as you get it, it just it goes away like water. So, you know, another trip comes up. Let's do the third trip. This one, we're going to Ecuador, Quito, because, you know, I already had two trips in Colombia. So, you know, let's go to Quito. Now. When I fly to Ecuador, we're supposed to meet up with somebody that never arrived, never showed up. I never met anyone, you know, and, and from day one, it was just bad. I had a bad vibe, you know, the whole way, um, the whole way down. I was just like nervous. So um, I just knew something was off. The guy never called me when he had to show up. You know, he never sent any any signals you know I was calling back to New York saying I need help nobody's coming to the hotel you know my bag got lost at the airport I didn't have any clothes and I had to go to the mall buy clothes so from day one it was horrible now finally on the day before I'm supposed to leave I get a phone call 
and it's the person that was bringing the drugs from Colombia to Quito, Ecuador. And he says, I should be there in about two hours, all right, and um, I'll meet you in the lobby. And so I said, all right, no problem. So two hours pass by. I go downstairs to the lobby, and I'm sitting there waiting. And this gentleman walks in. You know, he says, hey, I'm Diego. How's it going? Everything on? I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? You know, we act like we're old buddies, like everything's all right. And um, he hands me a bag where I think, you know, the shoes and stuff are coming in. And next thing you know, I go to get up and just everybody is all over me. They throw me to the ground, you know. They handcuff me. They pick me up. They put me in the elevator. They take me upstairs to my room. When we walk in, there's already police inside my room going through everything. They got the safe open. They're, they're you know, looking at my jewelry. They're looking at my, you know, my passport. They're like, oh, this passport's fake. I had traveled a lot, you know, prior to going to Colombia and my passport was a little old, so the plastic was, like, unfolding. It was, like, ripping up where the picture was. Everybody thought it was fake. So, you know, the police officer smacked me, said, you're not American. Where are you from? You, what are you, Colombian? And I was like, no, I'm American. And, you know, call the embassy. I'm American. And they were like, what do you have there? And I said, no, it's just money. Oh, okay. Well, we know it's heroin. I said, no, I, I'm, I thought it was just coming to pick up money. Well, no, it's heroin, and you're going to be in jail here for the next 25 years. I said, okay. So, you know, basically, they put me in the elevator, take me downstairs, and um, now we're on our way to Interpol. So when I arrive in Interpol, I walk past the room where I see the person that brought me the bag. He was sitting down speaking to some agents. And then, you know, obviously, you already know, he gave me up. Um... From there was just like the worst night of my life. You know, young kid in a foreign country, um, you know, didn't know what was going to happen. Had no idea what my future was like. They, uh, they put me in a holding cell. This was on December 18th. And um, I didn't talk to anyone until like December 23rd. They came up to me and said, you know, it's time to go. You know, we're going to be taking you to a small jail in the border with Colombia. I asked why, and they said, this is where your case starts. The person that was bringing the drugs got caught coming through the border and gave me up, basically. So he travels to Quito with the police. They do an operation on me. They lock me up, and now they're taking me back to this small jail. So six-hour ride, you know, all the way to this small jail in the back of a truck with no no top on it, anything. We're going through the mountains. I mean, it was insane. We arrive at Tulcan, which is a city in Ecuador that is border with Colombia. And um, they put me in this holding cell with about three other people. They were there for, you know, local crimes like robbery or whatever. And um, they immediately, you know, they talk to me. And I speak to them back in Spanish. And they're like, oh, my God, you speak Spanish? And I was like, yeah. They were like, oh, don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. This jail over here is great. You're going to love it. So immediately I'm thinking, like, where am I? What do you mean it's going to be great? They are like, yeah, don't worry. It's going to be a party. So a day later, which is December 24th, they walk me from the cell. This is basically like the police station where they have some holding cell. It's like outside, like wooden, metal, you know, thingamajig that they just made to hold some prisoners there you're in like basically the quartel of, of the police so you can't go anywhere there's no way you're going to escape there's 500 cops all around you they walk me down to the prison which is a small prison as i'm walking i hear music in the background real loud like somebody's having a party so as we get to the front entrance you know they open the doors and the music's even louder all i see is a bunch of guards and the guards are like hey how's it going you know, speaking to me in Spanish, I reply back. And they're like, oh, you ready? And I was like, ready for what? They're like, it's time to party inside, man. You're going to love it here. And I'm just like, you know, everybody's so nice. There's this lady guard that looks at me and she's like, oh, don't worry. You're going to be fine here. Everything's going to be all right. I said, okay. Once they walk me through like these, these hallways, I see at the end of the hallway a bunch of faces like moving around trying to look down the hall. And this is the entrance to 
I would say, you know, like the basketball courts, the patio. Once I get to the door, I see that there's women inside dancing. And I'm like, what is this? You know, they got salsa music. There's women dancing. There's kids. I'm like, okay. They open up the doors. I walk in. Everybody's like, hey, fresh meat. Yeah. Everybody's yelling. You know how it is when you walk in. Looking at this, at this white boy, you know, little young kid. Everybody's like, fresh meat, fresh meat. And then uh, this one guy walks up to me, tall white boy, green eyes. And he speaks to me with no accent at all. He's like, what's up, white boy? Come with me. I look at him like, what are you speaking? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, let's go. So he takes me. We're going to the, the guy that's in charge of the jail, going to his cell. So they walk me up the steps. You know, I'm looking around. I see people dancing salsa. I mean, full-blown dancing together, women and men. There's kids running around playing soccer. You know, I see three wooden huts, which I didn't know what was at the time. Later on, I would own one of those wooden huts. It was a store, one of the stores inside the jail. All right, so I walk up the stairs. We go into the cell, and it's basically it's visit day. And everybody's there. You can have your family inside with you. So I walk in, and it's this guy, which is what they call caporal. So it means he's like, he's the head honcho there. So I walk in. He's like, hey, how's it going? Have a seat. This is my wife. These are my kids. You know, this is my home for the next uh, eight years. So he's like, tell me your story. Why are you here? I explain everything to him. And he's like, all right, you know, you got set up, right? And I was like, yeah, of course. He's like, okay, where's the other guy? And I said, I don't know. They just transferred me by myself here. He said, okay. He's like, don't worry. Eventually, I think they'll bring him here. And he's like, and then you, you could see your friend again. And I was like, all right, sounds good. So he's like, you need anything? I was like, I really, um, I need to make a phone call. I was like, I haven't talked to my family in days. So he was like, all right, no problem. Cell phone. Guy pulls out a StarTac. And I'm talking, you know, the year 2001. He's flipped cell phone inside the cell. Bloop. Here you go. I'm like, I can make an international call with this? He's like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Called my mother. Now, this is, this is funny because, you know, I, it was the, a funny moment and a very sad moment at the same time because, you know, I call her up. There's music in the background. We got kids yelling and crying. You hear everything. I'm like, Mom, are you, are you sitting down right now? And this is December 24th. She hasn't heard from me. And, you know, and I'm the person that speaks to his mother every day, even now. You know, even if she's not living with me and maybe she's on vacation somewhere, I speak to my mom every day because, you know, she's everything to me. She's always been like that. So I haven't spoken to them, you know, my mother and my father in days. So they're really worried. So she picks up. She's like, oh, my God, I thought you were dead. What's going on? Why don't you call? And I'm like, listen, you need to sit down. All right. I'm in an Ecuadorian jail. And, you know, it's not looking good. And she starts going. She's like, you're such a liar. I hear the music in the background. What is wrong with you? Why are you lying to me? Where are you? I'm like, mom, listen, I'm telling you the truth. All right. What you have to do right now, hang up, call an embassy. All right. Call the American embassy and find out. I'm telling you the truth. Write down this number. I asked the guy for the number. He told me. We gave her the phone number. And she said, all right, I'm going to find out. And it was like that. The next day, she called me back. You know, it was it was horrible. You know, she was crying, you know, very upset. But um, those were the first moments walking into the jail. You know, one of the most um, craziest moments of my life. Because who would think inside of a jail? You know, people are dancing. There's women. There's kids. You know, there's stores, there's pool tables, um, you know, there's people playing pool, you know, there's you know, people standing there with a Coke can just drinking Coke, you know, like in the middle of the day. You know, I've never been locked up here. You know, I've been arrested, never made it to a jail. But, you know, they're way different down there. It's just crazy. So I, I can't believe that like this is just insane. Like it's literally wild. It, all for how much did you make off of those three runs? Um, basically, uh, twenty to twenty-two thousand each run. Each and and yeah. does it matter the weight or is it just e um, a run? Like, could they give you more than one on was, one trip? It was basically twenty dollars a grand they were paying back in the day. Um, around that time, the key was going for like sixty to sixty-five, depending where you sold it around New York or Jersey. And it was a little bit more expensive in Jersey, so we would actually 
move weight from Queens to like Elizabeth or Newark and we could get it, say, uh, 52 a gram and we could sell it like 62. So we'd make 10 grand just for transporting it. So you were selling it too? Of course, yes, yes. So you were getting it for them and also being their dealer on the street? Of course, yes. Oh, so you're double dipping a little bit. I mean, it was a good group of us. You know, we were about five. Um, we all worked together. We all did different things, but we all sold heroin and and cocaine and, and you know, a bunch of other things that, besides that. That's crazy. That's yeah. a lot of money, too. It was good money. For back in those days, it was very good money. Nowadays, not really, but— yeah. Well, what 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 do you think the, that group of individuals would have titled you as, like, within their organization? Are you, like, a smuggler, or is there a different yeah, word? probably. I mean, I was I was more of the of the smuggler. You know, we had the people, you know, I had my boy that had the connects where we could go sell it. Like we had um, a couple connects in Elizabeth, another connect in Newark, you know, and um, once we got it here to um, Queens, we would just have to transport it. And of course, get the money and, you know, it's 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 not only just transporting it, but then, you know, you have to go through with the, the whole deal, which is always risky at the end as well. All right. So you're in this jail. How's the legal process in Ecuador? <sighs> not good at all, man. I mean, they're backed up. Right. They got tons of um, traffickers in jails. They had just um, gotten rid of the two for one law. So I got I got arrested December 18th, 2001. They just took it off in November. Basically, anybody locked up before before November, they were getting two for one. So if you got an eight year sentence, you would do four. Now, a funny thing is, listen to this. People were charged with murder. They would get 16 years they would get the two for one. So they'd be out in eight for a life. That's insane. Now, when I got locked up, you know, they charged me with international drug trafficking. So they gave me eight flat. And, um, I mean, it was just like one of the worst days of my life, you know, just to get the, you get the door shut on you at such a young age. Is there a trial? Or, or of course, yeah. Work? It it lasted for more than a year. So basically, we would go to trial, come back, you know, present evidence. A um, year's long trial. Yeah, it was a little bit more than a year. Some people were there with for two years without being sentenced. Yes. Really? So this is way different than the United States criminal way different, justice system. Way different. Are you way assigned different. an attorney? Um, no, you don't get you don't. There's no public defender over there. If you don't have an attorney, you're screwed. Um, you have to get your own. And um, th- th- those are thousands, especially when they're, you're talking about, you know, I need help to get my American son out of jail. You can imagine how that goes. What yeah. about the embassy? Are they coming to visit to check on conditions at all? So basically, this is the, um, w- when my mother called the embassy and found out, they told her, no, you can't come down yet. Because at the time, there was a lot of guerrilla warfare going on at the border of Colombia and Ecuador with um, these people called Las Farc, which are, they're guerrillas. Um, they, they traffic, they kidnap, you know, they rob, they steal, they rape, they do everything. Um, so she, the, the, the embassy from the embassy, they actually came to visit me in a helicopter. They took a helicopter from Quito all the way to the, to the border. Um, they went to go see the jail, how it was. Obviously once they went inside and saw me, I'm all smiles and giggles, you know, they were like, Oh, you seem like you're pretty good here. You know, dressed like the way I am, you know, no problem. Watch on sneakers. Had glasses, you know, it's all, there's no prison uniform inside, you know, and, and I didn't look bad. I mean, no one's beating you in that jail. So, I mean, that jail was, it was amazing compared to where I went later. So the outfits, how does that work then if there's no uniform? Are there other clothes or are you in the same pair of clothes the entire time? You, you use whatever you have. So, but you didn't have anything. Oh, just the clothes that were busted at your hotel. They, just the clothes I had in my hotel. That's all I had. So I had, oh. you know, change of clothes. Um, but then, you know, you have to buy, right? Luckily, there's people there. They have visits come in. I'm like, hey, here's 200 bucks. Can you buy me, you know, underwear, socks, sneakers, you know, things, all, all kinds of stuff because um, everything I had got robbed, you know, I mean, watches, chains, the money. You know, I had uh, Canon cameras with huge lenses. Because when I came down, you know, I was taking pictures. I was going to the volcanoes, you know, like a tourist, right? You know, so I got I got the whole setup, but they stole everything. Are you worried that the people you're working for are going to think in that you're you're cooperating or anything? Of course. Yeah, that's always a worry um, at any time you get caught, you know, be wherever it be. But, I mean, 
what what could I do? I couldn't do anything. You I mean, know? technically, their employee fucked it up, right? Exactly. The, the first guy that got caught. The guy that was coming to bring the stuff gets caught. He got nervous. He got caught. And then he sets up the operation with the police. They call ahead to Interpol in Quito. So they're keeping an eye on me for a whole day before because they have to travel from the from the border. Remember, it's like a six to eight hour trip. So they call ahead. And even the hotel knew because then later on when I go to trial, I hear all the evidence, you know, the evidence of, you know, they saw me when I left the hotel that day. They were watching me where I went. When I came back, I went to the casino that was, you know, across the street. You know, um, they knew everything. They were watching. Me. Is there any chance of winning in a Venezuelan court or no? In an Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian court? Ecuadorian, yeah, Ecuadorian. Um, with a lot of money. Okay. So— I don't know if you've seen the news lately, but in Ecuador, there's corruption all the way to the top. And it's always been like that. Now, when I got locked up, there was, you know, tales of, oh, pay 10000 here. They'll transfer you to this jail. Then you pay another twenty there. You might get out. You know, things of that nature. But, I mean, can you really trust, you know, giving someone that amount of money and, and then they don't let you out? I mean, I don't know. I've heard tales. I never knew num- anybody that did it. I never knew of anybody that actually paid and got out, and I, I knew him, and I was like, wow, let's do it. And I'm sure I would have if, if that was the case, but, yeah, no. Ecuador is—the is, is the, the judicial system is horrible. So you get found guilty. Is it by a, a one judge, a panel judge? It was just one judge. Okay. One judge looks at, looks at uh, the evidence, hears the case, and basically sentenced me to eight years flat. And is everything in Spanish, all the proceedings? Everything is in Spanish, yes, everything. I couldn't imagine being there and— And not knowing Spanish. Yeah, if you—that's like I look at these people that are in Russian court that we see on the news. And they have headphones on that translate, luckily. But what about back in the day? Who knows? Yeah, that's very—that's literally my biggest fear, like foreign traveling. Imagine you're just in a foreign country and then like— Something goes wrong. Something goes wrong. Like those stories are devastating about the the murders with the roommates— like in and overseas and and this and that like that one girl what's her name that's popular, Which one? Uh, um her her roommate was like murdered and they they put the blame on her and she went through a whole trial overseas I forgot her name Amanda yeah. Knox is that her story I think oh I think so yes yeah yes. it just it's just so scary yeah no you know? it's it's terrifying man so I mean luckily when my first day and first year in the jail I was in was not bad. Okay. You know, besides the fact that you're locked up, you can't go anywhere. I mean, we had it all. You know, the cells, you, you have your own TV. You know, I had PlayStation. You know, I mean, I, I would spend all day paying, playing PlayStation, you know, things that you could never even imagine, you know, and pay a guard $20 to go bring you in some liquor. Wow. So that's like what we hear about European prisons, some European prisons. Yeah. I mean, basically, I think. <laughs> Everywhere around the world, there's going to be corruption. There was just a lot of corruption in Ecuador. The guards were making $180 a month. By the government. By the government. So they needed to— So imagine making $180 a month, and then you got to go take care of these drug traffickers that make more money in jail, you know, sitting there even selling drugs inside the jail than you do working every day. You know, so corruption is just everywhere, from the, you know, the director of the of the jails to, like— you know, the guards, you know, um, psychiatrists that, that are in the jail that you could pay for them. They will send you a letter so you can come out, you know, and relax and not be inside for a couple hours. You know, things like that. Everything had to do with money. You know, the, you could get drugs, you could get guns, knives, anything you could think of. Now, when you're found guilty, do they sentence you the same day? Yes. Automatic sentence that same day. So um, since after a year, I tried to escape. They sent me to the big jail. After so you went back. You got sentenced to eight years, seven years. Yes, and got, they sent you to the first jail. So I got sentenced to to eight years, but before getting sentenced, I tried to escape at the original jail, the original smaller jail. Okay, just tell us right? that. So basically, um, it the cell. There were six of us in the cell. All right, um, one of them was a Spaniard, which was he weighed about four hundred pounds. So this guy couldn't go with us. So what we did was every night we would make it accustomed to when we get locked in our cells at 7 p.m., we would have like chocolate and bread with ham and cheese, you know, like sandwiches, you know. So we would sleep this guy 
we would put something that would make him go to sleep, you know, in his chocolate milk or his coffee. And then we would go to work, you know, on the top bunk, we had a huge dresser because even that we could have, you know, it was basically set up like, you know, if you're in uh, an academy and there's two bed bunks on each side, you know, everything's made out of wood and then you could make dressers. So we all had our own dresser where we could put our stuff, you know, we had all our clothes, all our, you know, cosmetical stuff and all that. But um, we would bring down this dresser that was attached to the to the roof, and we would start cutting. So little by little, every day, we'd do a little bit of work to make this hole. Now, once we cut through the entire wall, on the top of our wall, there was a cage. It was basically all, uh, all like, threaded rod, basically. It was just all throughout the entire, the entire top. You could stick your head out through the top of the hole, and you could see that there was just rods everywhere. So now, now we need a, a, a sawzall that'll, you know, cut that, that metal. And um, obviously there's a workshop there, so um, we pay somebody to, to get, us, get us these blades. And little by little, we're cutting. And this, is, this goes on for about four or five months. Um, every day we would cut and then put it back, secure it. In the meantime, there's guards coming to do searches in the cells, you know, because they want to check and make sure we're secure. So every time they're coming in, your heart's beating. You never know what's going to happen. You know, first floor cells were even worse. They would come in with these huge metal bars and just start banging on the ground because they know, you know, people want to make tunnels. They could make tunnels from the inside out. And if you got a lot of money, you could have it done from the outside in, you know, like, like Chapo did. So we, um, we finished doing the cutting. Everything's set. You know, we're waiting to go. We have a search. The police come in and do a search. And there's about, I don't know, 200 police officers all masked up. They looked at the Ninja Turtles, you know, black, these, these black things on with the, all the vests and, you know, everything possible. And they're running through the cells. They're throwing, you know, everything out. You know, they're hitting us as we're coming out, you know, kicking, you know, batons. There's no human rights over there. I mean, it's, it's serious. So... They find the hole and immediately begin to beat us. I mean, they beat us for, I, I would say, a good five minutes without stopping. Um, after that, we're all put in the hole, everyone in the cell. Uh, they took us to the hole. You know, they immediately closed the cell. They put their own locks on it. And um, the next day, you know, basically they told me, you know, get ready because, you know, you're going to be transferred soon. So... About a week later, three o'clock in the morning, you know, you hear the, the the rattling of the keys and the locks when they're open up doors. So immediately I go to the to my door, I stick out the mirror, I'm looking, and I see that they're coming. So oh boy, here we go. Three AM. I'm on my way to Quito to the big jail. So that was another, you know, six, seven hour drive. Got there, it was early morning. We stopped somewhere to get breakfast. And um, about 10 minutes later, we're walking into the big prison. Now, this is the big leagues. You know, this is not where I was and nothing I've ever seen before or even thought of in my life. As um, soon as we walk in, you know, they're like, these are the guys that tried to escape. They already know why you're coming. And immediately start getting beaten. And um, the hole in that big prison was about four floors up. So you'd have to go up the steps. And they had a line of officers and guards all the way up the steps, just with waiting with batons to hit us. So we're running, you know, I'm, I'm gunning it from the first floor up. They're like, move, move, move. You know, they're all screaming at you in Spanish, go, go, go. And you're just running. You're just feeling all these hits left, right. You don't know where it's coming from. You know, I fell a couple times, got kicked, got back up, ran. Crazy. So finally get to the hole. They open up the door. Now, th this is like the movies, gloomy, dirty, the lights like flickering. It's like, it's like a horror movie. When they open up the door to the hole, you know, I go in, I see there's like five or six people on the floor on these little thin mats. And then we have six beds, which are like bunk beds. They're made out of concrete. First thing I hear is, white boy. 
And I look, and it's it's another white boy just like me. And I'm like, what's up, bro? And he's like, hey, man, what's going on? He's like, finally an American. I'm like, oh, my God, bro, you don't know how happy I am. I was like, what's your name? So immediately, you know, I go to his bed, sit down. He's like, bro, come here, come here. And he made a little spa for me, you know. And he's like, bro, you good? You need... You need you want some yogurt, Coca-Cola? He had everything, you know, snacks, all that good stuff. Cigarette. And I'm like, bro, let me get a cigarette, man. Please, I'm stressed out. And he's like, all right. He's like, what are you here for? So I'm telling my story. And he was like, oh, man. He's like, you tried to escape too? He's like, what do you think I'm here for? And I was like, you tried to escape? He's like, yeah. He's like, I was banging the psychiatrist upstairs. You know, I got her to bring me in a police uniform. And he walked out the front door with it. He went through three, three spots, three security checks. And they didn't notice him. Now, when he's walking down the street, because the jail was like on a hill, he's walking down the street. This is the change of like, you know, the duty change. They're coming, you know, they work from 12 to 12. So now it's the shift change. The other shift's walking up the hill while this shift's walking down. And he's walking down. He was a tall kid like me. And, he's, you know, he's white. You know, Ecuador ain't too many white people. You know, I mean, you could find them, but it's very rare. And then one of the guards looks up and sees him, and he's with another guard, and they tackle him to the ground, and they catch him, dressed up with the whole uniform, the boots, everything. Now, the psychiatrist got, she was, she, they, they threw her in jail, obviously, because, you know, they knew that he had gone out on a pass to see the psychi psychiatrist because it has to get signed by a couple people. And then the guard goes and gets you and says, you have a pass to go. So, obviously, she went to jail. I never heard about her again. But, um, yeah, that was my first moment walking into the hole, which was crazy. Holy cow. What's, um, what's the food like in the max, this oh. max security one? What are they feeding you? And are you in a cell all day or is it more free? So or? if it's, um, if, yeah, the max, max part is um, 22 hours closed and two hours outside. But you got a bunk mate. You got a bunk mate. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, some, some people have, they live by themselves. They're lifers, you know. They don't want anybody, and they're not going to put anybody in there. So, you know, the lifers you respect, and these are the people that are running the jails. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. There's a lot of rules. You know, I can imagine the same rules as here. You know, lifers, you know, you have to know somebody to talk to them. You know, you can't just, you know, go and talk to anybody. And plus, back in the day over there, there was, you know, a lot of big mobsters. You know, they're big traffickers. You know, they have walls around them where, you know, you can't get too close to them, you know. Um, and then, I mean, it was just, it's like out of the movies. You can't believe it. Now, doesn't the cartel have a lot of influence in these prisons? Like, couldn't they have helped you out? So, I didn't work for a cartel. That's mm -hmm. the thing. I just worked for a bunch of guys that were, you know, doing their thing. You don't think they no, were connected at we all? We all worked together, but no, mm -hmm. no, no, no. I don't think they were connected to the cartel in any way. So they just happen to have foreign connects? They have foreign connects because, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the guys I was working with, like, one of them had his brother down there. So, you know, his brother could get the connect to get the drugs cheap. You know, he could fly some people down, you know, get them to bring it back. So, I mean, it was just a small group of people just doing their thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the, how, what about the food aspect of it? Food was horrible. I mean, just think about, you know, we have food in jail where they're making food for, you know, I think it was— 2,800 people when I arrived at the jail. On a visit day, there could be anywhere between three and 4,000 people with all the people that are coming in, visits, mothers, fathers, you know. But the food that is made at the jail is the worst. You don't want to eat that. Now, if you don't have a choice, you have to. If you're in, uh, in the max, you have to eat that food. You can't eat anything else. If you're in general popu population, you have your choices. You have stores, you have restaurants, you can even send um, send to buy things outside. Like I could send, uh, go get me Pizza Hut, you know, bring me McDonald's, you know. Where it, does that money come from? If you, um, money I had, my money that would uh, be sent by my my family, you know, you know, you could hustle in jail. You could make make your own, you know. But is there like an electronic system, or are they everything sending is an, cash? So they're sending you an envelope to the to the prison. No, basically Western Union. Okay. So Western Union, somebody, that visit, or if it's your girlfriend, your wife, they'll bring in that money for you. You know, they could bring you food. So, you know, like my visit would go, go to the supermarket, bring me all the stuff, you know, meat, you know, cheese, milk, yogurts, Coca-Cola, 
And I had a fridge in my cell where I could put everything. And this is even in the max? No, in the max, no. This is in general population. Uh, and okay. Maximum security, you don't have anything. It's just you and your cell. But general pop is where you serve the majority of your sentence? Correct. Okay. Now, yes. Now, um, I, I'm so grateful for you that you were able to speak Spanish. Correct. Because I yeah. couldn't imagine dealing with this if you couldn't speak Spanish. If you couldn't speak Spanish, Holy it was going to be very shit. difficult. And I had the chance to deal with people that didn't know how to speak Spanish. Delta, you know, I was a translator, just like my friend Lenny that's outside. He, you know, he, he was a translator sometimes for some people that didn't know how to speak Spanish. You know, we knew people that came in from England. You know, uh, he got locked up with his father for trafficking. They didn't know a word of Spanish. And the mobsters were calling me and calling him, translate for us, you know, let them know. Are the majority of the people there for smuggling? Um, I would say everyone that's a foreigner in that jail is there for smuggling. So, like, we had Africans, Haitians, you know, Americans, people from Sweden, people from England. The, everybody in the, in the globe was over there, you know. But um, everybody that's Ecuadorian... They're mostly there for murder, um, robbery. You know, they love to rob banks. They love to, to rob the Brinks trucks down there. Yeah, they're big on that, and they're big gangs. You know, when I was down there, that's what the gangs would do to fuel their, their gang, to buy more guns, to buy more drugs. You know, they would go into a bank, 10, 11 of them, you know, and stick up everybody, start shooting, you know, and it was like the wild, wild west. Were there uniforms in this one, the second prison you were in? No uniforms. So you're everybody, still using the same clothes? Everybody everybody uses their own clothes, but you can go, you buy clothes. You have clothes brought in. I would call my mom, Ma, yeah, you could send me a pair of Nikes? Yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. Mm -hmm. and she sent me a little gift package, you know, T-shirts, some sneakers, you know, a cologne, whatever. You could bring anything into the jail. Are they making you work? Do you have to have a prison job? There's no jobs there. Nothing. No jobs. Okay. Nothing. The, this place, it's funny because it's called the center of rehabilitation, right? But there's no rehabilitation in there. All there was was murder, extortion, you know, drug dealing. Um, that's it. There was no rehab there at all. It, now, is it like a clean place or is it like dirt Not cell at all. floor cells? What is it? What is this? So like? basically, it's all made of concrete. Um, this was the barracks for a fighter that freed Ecuador back in the day. His name is Eloy Alfado. You can look him up on Google. They basically, this was like their um, their base. Now, years later, it was turned into a jail. So it's all concrete and metal. All right. Inside, I remember I would wake up sometimes 6 a.m. and open up the door and you could breathe and see your breath like if you were in Jersey, like if it's about to snow because it's all concrete and it's all metal. So it was really cold in the morning, you know, but... Um, Dirty place, wires hanging everywhere. You know, now when you buy your cell, because obviously you have to buy your cell over there. That's another thing. You don't just get assigned a cell, you know, you have to buy your own. So I bought my cell. You, you could fix it up any way you'd like. You paint it, you could put separations in it. You know, you could uh, have someone from outside bring you in some wood, you know, and uh, the tools you need to do like separations where there's a door between where you sleep and the bathroom. You know, which I had made, you could have a shower put in, you know, brought in a TV, a microwave, your stove. You know, we had everything there. Uh, this is just mind blowing. Like just, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Another thing is um, we used to make liquor there. Hooch, what would they call it? Well, like we called it hooch in prison so and white lightning. Basically, it was like hooch. But what we would do is we would get yeast, like um, two or three pounds. And then we'd get 10 pounds of sugar, and then we'd pay the guards to bring us in some fruits, like oranges, grapes, and all that stuff. And I'd put in, like, those Home Depot buckets, and we'd stick them under the bed and just cover with plastic and put the top on. And we'd leave it for, like, 8 to 10 days, and that's just bubbling. It's all bubbling inside, turning into liquor. Then we created a contraption where we could actually put something inside the bucket that would heat up this hooch. And it would bring all the, you know, condensation up. Condensation is the actual 100% liquor. And it's just coming out of hose. You know, I have pictures I forgot to bring, but I could send them to you. Yeah, it, send it was, them to me. It was amazing. You know, we were making liquor inside the cell. I have pictures with my mother inside the cell. She's on a cell phone. We're making liquor. 
You know, she's just, just allowed to come in. She's inside the cell with me. We would have visits. You know, we would um, every 15 days there was sleepover. So you got your girl. Your girl walks in the jail at 8 a.m. and she walks out Sunday at 5 p.m. And she's sleeping in the she's jail. She's sleeping so? in the jail, and we're partying at night. Did you have a girlfriend? Of course, many. Wait, these are just ones you met in, uh, out there, or in the jail? Yes, when you know this guy's wife would come, and she'd bring along a friend, and oh, let me meet her. Or you know, there was girls you could call up. You know, the prepaid girls. You know, there was prostitutes coming to the jail just to look for work. Holy cow! I'm yeah. shocked you haven't been on like a hundred podcasts yet. It was, it was a party, man. <laughs> yeah, it was a party. This is fascinating. How are the people that are from there treating Americans that are housed in jail there? So let me tell you, not too friendly. All right. Um, number one, because you know, I I never like to. Uh, you can't show too much. Number one, and that's with that, that's a rule I have anywhere in life. You know, because sometimes the people don't like to see you doing well. Sometimes people don't like to see that you have visit, but I'm a lifer and I don't, you know, that was difficult because, you know, I wanted visit. That's half of your jail time. When you have someone or something to look forward to, you know, every Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday, those are three days out of the week where I'm chilling. You know, I'm not worrying about the gang banging that's going outside. You know, I'm not worrying about the stabbings or because when it's visit day, 100%. The visits are respected, and you cannot do anything on a visit day. You know, it's everybody's in their own world. You know, every there's kids running around. You know, there's restaurants open. There's families sitting down eating. You know, and and you just got to be careful. It's a delicate situation. You know, you can't get into trouble because the mob will have your head. And what about is there like gambling and and oh, of card course. playing every day, everywhere? I mean, everywhere you looked. You know, I told you I had I had a pool table. There was multiple pool tables in that jail. I had one. Um, I had it for about two years. I mean, it's not like you're making a ton of money because you're renting it out for a dollar an hour, right? But the thing is that that's the gambling spot. So you're making more money off it because you're going to gamble. You know what I mean? Everybody's going to gamble. We're playing cards. We're playing Parcheesi. We're playing you guys had Parcheesi? We're playing everything. Oh, we're playing with the I guards. Love that game. <laughs> the guards were coming in, sitting down with us, playing outside. On the courts, because we had like um, basketball or soccer courts. Everything's concrete, but we're outside. And they would walk the, the yard with us, and they would sit down and play. They'd be like, hey, you guys, when you're done, I got 10, and I want to play. All right, no problem. Come back in like 10 minutes. Is it, Do you think the prison is still like that today? Have you talked to guys that are still so, there? Let me tell you this. Um, the jail I was in shut down because they built new jails, of the American style. So now everybody's wearing uniforms, you know. Now the cells are all bars. There's no doors or walls. Where I was, I had a wall and a door, and I could even lock my door from the inside. If I don't want you coming in my cell, you're not coming in. You know, like, if if I see the police coming in in the yard, I'm running to my cell. I'm going to lock the door. I'm going to hide and get rid of everything before you even get there. You know, the new jails, you can't do that anymore. Everything is just bars. You could see right through it. And it's just horrible. It's even worse than before. I got to say, that's actually a very smart thing that you could lock from the inside. It w I think prisons in the U.S. would be a lot safer if you could do that. And then obviously there could be an override for like if a prison guard. Of course. But think about in these penitentiaries, they yes. pop the cells in the morning. Yes. How many stabbings, like we read about these uh, famous yes. people getting stabbed up and whatnot. That's because they're popping all the doors and it's a free for all. So I have a story that has something to do with that. Okay. So basically, my first time I was in Max, you know, I met this guy. We're going to call him Lizard. Lizard. All right. Um, he was a top dog out there. And later on, when I got out of that Super Max and got back in the general population, I got put in a cell with this kid called, um, he was called Chico Millon, which means the million dollar kid. Now, this kid was known for setting up robberies on the outside. He had to connect to people that worked in banks and brinch trucks. So he would get the drop on the trucks or the bank, the info on how much money's getting pushed through that day, who's going to have it, where it's going to go down. And he would get together groups that would go and, you know, take over, take these bags of money. And um, when I got at Supermax, I just so happened to land in his cell. Now, about two months prior, a group of about 10 got tortured and killed. So I'm saying a group of about 10, this is, this is a small gang. 
and he put together the robbery. So within that group of 10 was one of Lizard's brothers. So since I'm living in the cell with this kid now, you know, someone approaches me and is like, hey, Lizard wants to talk to you. You got to call him now on this number. He gives me the cell phone. I call him up. And so Lizard basically says, you know, we know you're living with, uh, you know, the million dollar kid, you know, so I know you already know what happened the other day. My brother was involved and I need you to open the door at 6 a.m. tomorrow because Giovanni's going to come in and he's going to take care of him. You know, I'm not a lifer. You know, I have something to look forward to and a family that I want to get home to. So obviously this situation for me was tough. You know, I've already been living with the kid for like two weeks. You know, you become friendly once you're living with somebody in the cell. You know, you, your stories, your friends. I knew this guy, I knew that guy. You know, we eat together. You know, it's 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 hard. And um, But you have to make that decision. Is it going to be him or is it going to be both of us? So at the end of the day, you know, I agreed. And um, 6 a.m. comes the next day and I open up the door. And luckily, there was nobody there. So the guy that was supposed to come and do the hit, he didn't want to do it. We get a call from Lizard again. What happened? And um, basically, he's like, you guys got till tomorrow. It better happen. So tomorrow, the next day, I'm, you know, that night, I'm, you know, I'm on my bed. I was on the top bunk. He was on the bottom bunk. But on the wall, on the other side of us, we had a huge mirror. So, you know, we're watching TV at night, you know, smoking a J. And I'm, I'm looking at him in the mirror like, you don't know, this is going to be your last moments, you know. And I'm sorry to say, but I'm, I'm, I'm opening that door, you know. And um, the next day I open the door, I walk out, he's not there again. My heart drops. I'm like, now we're in trouble because now Lizard's not going to be happy, you know, and now we're both in it. So basically, um, I go up to the kid's cell. I'm like, what's going on, man? Are you going to do this or what? And he's like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to be a robot for this guy anymore. I'm done with it. You know, if anything, you know, he sends anybody to this block to take care of me. He's like, you got to help me. I'll take the charge. You know, because over there, there could be multiple people that go in and, you know, take care of somebody. <laughs> as long as there's one person that say, I did it, they'll be like, all right, he did it. So that's why there's people in there that'll take charge for a murder easily because they're lifers. You know, once you get a life sentence, you know, they could take care of, you know, three, four, five, ten people. They don't really care because they're not going anywhere. So this kid was a lifer and he said, I'm not being a robot anymore. You know, I'm not doing it. And um, this kid lizard had um, the hitman's brother killed in another jail. This is how much power the kid had. Lizard had a lot of power. He was a young kid, just like us. I think he was like 27, 28. I was probably 25 at the time. But he was running a gang of about 3,000 people easily in the streets, in other jails in Ecuador, and in the jail I was. And he was in the max, but he would send the kite. He would send, you know, a text message, and you would have a lot of problems. You know, once he got to any jail, he would call the drug dealers. I'm here. What are you sending me? You know, until um, everybody got tired of that. And then one day they took care of him. Wow. Yeah. The fucking nuts. Crazy story, man. Now, you know what's interesting about all this is that you probably would have gotten the same amount of time in the United States. Really? For, for, for that much weight. You know, it probably would have been a five-year mandatory minimum. Okay. I, it probably would have been, you know, five to ten first defense. You probably would have gotten seven. So it's kind of interesting how on par their system was at the time with ours. Because I know in other countries it's nowhere near that. It's a lot stricter. Yeah. Let but me... you weren't actually caught with the weight kind of, though. You were. I mean, you almost exchanged it. That was more, I don't know, it's complicated in that aspect. If I was in the States, I probably would have won the case. I'll tell you why. Because I did not have a hold of the full key. Okay. Right? When they gave me whatever was in that bag, it wasn't all of the of the merchandise. So, you know, that should have played a big part, but obviously we're in Ecuador and they're not hearing it. Um, you know, it's just, 
It's just crazy. Did you get any word to your partners over those seven yeah. years? Did you get to talk to them? Uh, I spoke to them, you know, probably the first three months I was uh, locked up. They sent a couple care packages, but after that, man. They didn't if, take care of you the whole if time. If you're not around, mm. it's like a, you're a dead man walking. Nobody cares. And how do you become the smuggler? Why, why couldn't any of them do it? What made you special? I was the only American. These, these guys are the all, okay. yeah, I was the only one with the blue passport, man. You know, new English, new Spanish, you know, um, it was a young kid. Um, and I was willing, you know, at that age, I was scared of nothing. You know, I wanted to do it all. And, um, I had to just, you know, find out the hard way. Did you ever talk to them again? Never. Are you ever curious about what they're up to? Not at all, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, once I came out, I was just, you know, happy to be alive number one, and um, happy to have, uh, you know, a family to come home to. And then, you know, the moral of the story is, you know, you could have gone through whatever you went through, but if you want to, you could be successful. You can be whatever you want in this life. You know, you don't have to sell drugs. You know, you don't want to end up in a jail like I did in a foreign country. You don't want to traffic. Do you, was there, when you look back on it now, was there another thing that you were kind of leaning towards, like maybe going to college, starting a career? Was there anything like that? No. I, I wanted to be in the life. Okay. That's what I wanted from a young age. Where does that come from, though? I would say it has a lot to do with uh, movies, you know, listening to the music. It was just, you know, like Scarface, Goodfellas, you know. It's just something that, like, it captured me. Captured, you know, the power you get. Or when you walk in somewhere and they know you, you know, the presence that they feel when you're in the room, you know, something like that. It's just, you know, it's like an adrenaline rush. And when you're trafficking, that's another one. When you got keys on you, you know, you're going to sell some keys. You're bringing back 150,000 back in, the, in those days. You know, you, you get an adrenaline rush, you know, and you're walking around with a gun on you. You know, it's it, all these things, you know, you make you feel powerful. Okay, so that stirs the debate up with people, though, about... Our video games, our movies, our, our, is music a bad influence? Is it those things themselves or is it the person that's consuming that? No, yeah, it's all, it's all about the person. Everybody's different, you know. Like I said, you know, a lot of people say, oh, blame the parents. But it's not like that. You know, it's, it's, it's all about that person. Everybody's different. So the day you released, do you do a full straight seven years? There's no good time, nothing like that? There's nothing. I did six years, 10 months, and 26 days. So you get out what? that day like did they give you a plane ticket or you got so nothing? basically i was free for like three months while i was still in jail because immigration was backed up i was in the supermax for the last nine months of my prison stay and um basically one day they just showed up and said immigration's here they're gonna take you i was like all right and then they took me to an immigration jail that i was there for about two weeks until uh my beautiful sister bought me a plane ticket and got me back over to the States. What does the United States say to you when you come back after seven? Like your passport hasn't been stamped in, in seven years, right? So, no, I didn't have a passport. That's funny. Um, so when I went to leave, obviously I need a passport to travel. So I go to the U.S. Embassy and they're like, sure, yeah, we can get you a passport. It's going to be uh, $250. I said, lady, I've been in jail for the past seven years. Where do you expect me to get $250? And she was like, Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll get you a temporary passport. So that's what they did. It's a passport like this thin with like two pages on it. And it was temporary. It had holes in it. They punched holes through it, you know, and, um, and that's it. I, I got back on the flight. Are you ever going to go back to Ecuador? Never. Are you ever going to step foot outside the country? Yes, I have already. Mm -hmm. um, flying back is a hassle. You know, you know, your red flag with Interpol. Every time oh, you're I come flagged back. with yes, Interpol. Of course, yeah. Really? For yeah. the rest of your life? I would say, I mean, every time I, you know, come back from an international trip, you know, they get sent to the to to the room. They're like, Oh, follow that line, sir. So I have to go that way. Are there countries you can't travel to? Um, I couldn't travel to Ecuador for the first five years when I came out. Not that you would want to. <laughs> yeah. They said I couldn't travel there, I couldn't do any money transactions, and that's about it. But I can go anywhere in the world. Luckily, uh, I was arrested over there and went to prison over there. So over here, there's no record. Yeah, I guess that's the other end of the foot. That's another, you know, There's plus. pros and cons to of that. Course. Of course. Because it would be more detrimental if it's ruined over here. Yes. So how does that work when you get back with taxes, with everything? Like, how is your life affected by being in a foreign prison? Just like from a 
a regular standpoint, not even a psychological standpoint, just like with the way, you know, the structure is of your life. Yeah. So, I mean, what can I say? I lost a lot of years over there, you know, and when you get back, you know, obviously you're not the same person. You know, I know jail changed me a lot. It cha- it'll change anybody, um, especially where I was and the way you have to handle yourself, the way you, you know, the things you see, you know, it's, it's a lot different. So coming back was a challenge, you know, um, getting a, 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 your first job was a challenge. I came back in 2008. We were in the middle of a recession. You know, there was really no work, um, you know, no resume because I've been out of the country, you know, for the past seven years. Um, it was a, it was a challenge. But, you know, I like challenges. So basically, you know, no car, nothing. Just, you know, I had my family that was there for me. My mother, my father, you know, my sisters. Um, you know, she was great. As soon as I got back, you know, took me to buy me all new clothes. You know, it's like starting over again. So basically, that's what I did. You know, got a job and just started little by little, you know, um, now, thank God, you know, I'm successful and I'm, I'm proud of where I am. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be alive. I'm happy to be able to tell my story. You know, um, I want to share it, not only just to share the stories, but to also let everybody know that, you know, like you said, I'm always the guy that walks in the room and says, yeah, I was in prison. I lived through all this stuff. That's what made me who I am. And I'm here, you know, and, and, and I'm going to make it, you know, no matter what, you know, be it here, be it in in China, uh, you could put me anywhere on the planet. You know, I'm going to come out on top. So, you know, that's the goal, just to push that message, you know, and um, just let you know, you know, any mistake you make, you know, you could overcome them. Just don't, don't make the same mistake twice. you got to learn from your mistakes, you know. What did it take for you to get to that point, though? Because, you know, most people, when they get out of prison, they don't have that, that mentality. They don't want to talk about it. And I'm sure there was a ton of people in your case that were curious about your time in prison. So when did you finally overcome being able to talk about it? Um, I'll tell you, since I've gotten out, you know, people that I get close to or, or, you know, people I've known, especially everybody in my family or, you know, coworkers that I get close with, you know, I I let them know, you know, this is where I was, you know, that this is what I went through. Um, I really have no shame in it. You know, I have no shame in what I went through. I think it's made me the man I am. You know, I just think, you know, everybody has different life experiences. You just got to learn from them. Yeah, I, I really can see your, you, you, I know you're launching a YouTube channel. Um, I could see you telling, because you have seven or eight years worth of stories, you know, just because people are fascinated with this type of stuff. Yes. I, I could see you building a very successful YouTube channel, social media presence, just telling stories from there because it's so unique in a world where, you know, kind of like the prison content genre is like it, it's it's very you know wide and big and broad now and, and a lot of people are doing it you have a very very unique perspective yes that you could get into that i feel like if you do it right you could really hit it home and blow it up and you're you're well spoken and you know that's why i just let you go for the first half of it because you have it like you're a good storyteller good. And, and you knew how to put the the pieces that together like with the hooks and what to say and this and that like it didn't you know it, it flowed really good um, and, and I think it'll hopefully it'll help your story get out there because you told it so perfectly where other people can watch it and expand on it. And, you know, it's just and in a world where they're making TV shows about people in prison and this and that. That's right, man. I mean, <laughs> let's make our mistakes our success. That's all I say. You know, I, I love what you've done. You know, you're an inspiration to me and many people. Um, and, yeah, you know, just because you got locked up doesn't mean it's the end of your life. You know, you could make something to yourself. You know, you could be successful, especially in this country, right? You know, other countries, it's a lot harder. But here, I mean, we got it all, man, you know? What do you do now for work? What's your life like Right now, now I own a commercial cleaning company with my wife. Um, we're also getting to the FBA, Amazon. Um, you know, we're just, you know, surviving, man. You know, just living life day by day. I'm happy. You know, I have a beautiful wife. I have my mother at home with me, you know, I take care of. You know, she deserves it after all those years of pain I put her through. You know, Mom, I love you. You're the best. <laughs> and um, that's it, man. I just thank you for everything. I hope we can work together in the future. I'm really happy to meet you. And, you know, I can't wait to um, to just continue. What does your wife think about this? Um, she loves the fact that, you know, I'm open to to doing this. She loves the fact that, you know, 
I have the push, I have the want, and I just feel like, you know, you know, don't listen to anybody, what they tell you, you know, do what you want to do. And if you get up and do it every single day, you're going to be successful at it. That's, that's, that's going to be it. How did you tell her about your experience? Cause it's not like she needed to search. Like you could have probably gotten away with not even telling her ever like that. You could have kept that whole Venezuelan thing a secret, right? So I'm mean, not Venezuelan. Ecuador. Ecuador. I don't know why I keep yeah, saying yeah, Venezuelan. Yeah. So let me tell you, it's, this is another <laughs> crazy story, which you're going to love. Okay. So this is how I meet my wife. I was working as a manager at a, at a tower company, you know, it works for cell phone towers, you know? Um, so one of the workers was taking the van home. Now his van gets stolen. He calls me at 5 a.m. The work van got stolen. I don't know what's going on. I got to get to the office to go track the van. So I'm hustling. I get to the office. You know, I'm looking on, on the computer. The van's gone. It's somewhere in Orange, New Jersey. You know, I'm like, geez, it's stolen. Call the cops, everything. Now the kid that got the van stolen, he has footage from his apartment building. And there's a van that pulls up next to our van, and the guy jumps out and steals it. Now, the van that they jumped out of had a name on it. So I look up the name on Google, and it's like a place where you could send money to foreign countries. Or you could send packages to foreign countries like Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela. So I call up this company, you know, and somebody picks up. The young lady picks up. I'm like, yeah, I'm just calling because, you know, one of your vans stole one of my vehicles. Um, she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, so we have footage of someone using your company vehicle, pulling up next to my company vehicle, getting out, shaming the door, and stealing it. I was like, um, you know, what are we going to do about this? She's like, hold on one second. And she goes outside, and their van is gone. So someone stole their van, then drove around and saw our van, <laughs> stole that van as well, and then took off. Now, I'm in com communication with the police telling them, look, you know, I'm looking at the tracker. It's here. So they're like, all right, we're on our way. I'm like, all right, I'm on my way too. So boom, I'm, I'm heading down the parkway. I'm going to where the van is. You know, and she calls me. I'm, she's like, did you see our van? I'm like, yeah, your van's right here. So I end up continuing the conversation because now we're mixed in with this, you know, her van was stolen. Mine stole hers. We're getting the police reports, all this stuff. And, um, end up talking to this young lady and I end up asking her out and she is my wife now. Wow. Yeah. And then you had to tell her about. And yeah, as soon as I met her, you know, she was Ecuadorian. So I'm like, geez, I, <laughs> you can't I get told away her, from I was like, it. I can't get away from you people. What's going on? You gotta she's say, like, what I'm do you never mean? going back to your home country. <laughs> I was like, Ecuador. And she's like, why? I was like, oh God, it's a long story. She's like, tell me. I was like, all right, I did seven years in prison there. She was like, what? No, she thought I was lying because who's going to believe you? You know what I mean? A young kid, you know, you don't look like you've been in prison all your life. I mean, prison life isn't like it is here where everybody's tatted up. Nobody's tattooing in the jails down there. Really? Yeah. In Ecuador, it was not Even yeah. with the gangs and stuff? I mean, it's very odd. I mean, it's not like up here. I mean, I got a tattoo down there and a bunch of people got tats, but. In the prison? Yeah, in the prison. What with was like, your prison with tattoo? Like a, with like a pen. Well, they, they oh, used like to call me. like a pick and poke? Yeah. Okay. They used to call me Casper, you know, white boy. So I got a Casper <laughs> with the, you know, with the flames. Casper, and the, yeah. I could see Casper. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> it, that was a crazy eight hour tattoo, you know. Just horribly. You know what's cool though is that you could look back on it and you could tell the story with excitement after being through something so miserable, and it could keep you alive. And you know, you have this excitement to it, and you're ready to share it and get out there and and you know own it. You know, and I think that's great, and I think that's what the message is of the show. That's right, man. You know, and you just you take it, you run with it, and you wear it like a badge. And you know, fuck it. What can anyone say after that? That's it, man. I lived it. Nobody else did. You know. Yeah. Well, Oscar, thank you so much, man, for the gift, for coming on the show. I think this is going to be a huge episode. Thank you, brother. And uh, if you need anything, let me know. And I'm excited to see you get that YouTube channel out there. Thanks a lot, Ian. I'm definitely going to hit you up for some help on that, all right? Absolutely. Thanks, brother. <laughs>